That pie that represents the legislative branch of government, it is one quarter of one percent. If you were to do a fraction, that's uh, that's one four hundred. It's actually worse than that. It's one four hundred and fiftieth of that whole pie. And so uh, uh, we kind of bounce off the walls down there in the state house. And typically we. We see 800 to 1,000 bills a year. There's 105 of us. And because of the committee process and how kind of bills get weeded out, any one of us is going to vote on about 600 bills each session. And we do this with, with uh, no help. I got a nasty email from a guy once. And he said, if you don't vote for blah, 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 I don't remember what it was, I'm going to work to take away several of your layers of staff. Well, you're looking at my staff. It's me, myself, and I. And, uh, you know, we don't have any staff. And, uh, and I've kind of been pushing for it. I've done a few things to try, to try to get us some staff. And I just really have run into some brick walls. And I think the mentality is, or the thinking is, boy, if we, if we hire more people in the legislative branch, we're going to be, you know, growing government. It's going to look like big government. But I, don't, I, I think you've got to look a little bit beyond that. The way I see it is, is we're trying to do things on the cheap. And so it's like we built a house and we didn't put any insulation in it because that was cheaper. But then we spent a lot of extra money heating the house down the road because it has no insulation. And because the legislative branch of government is not really able to scrutinize the issues and the things and it really represent the people and dig into issues of corruption and, and uh, mishandling of constituents, um, we might be doing things cheaper in the legislative branch of government, but a whole bunch is getting by us. And I think if we added a few dollars here, we could save tens of millions over there. And uh, so that's one thing that I think needs to really change. Something I've been really frustrated with. Something I've tried to work on, but, but I've run into just uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, uh, no response from those people who need to carry that ball forward. I even recruited uh, a professor at Boise State who offered to do a ten thousand, no, a hundred thousand dollar study. All he needed was his ex out of pocket expenses taken care of. He's written a few books on state legislatures, and he recruited the nation's expert who's written a whole bunch of books on state legislatures. A guy from Rutgers University who offered to donate his time. So we're going to get this hundred thousand dollar study for eight thousand dollars of out of pocket pocket expenses, but I. I failed in my attempt to pitch that to the legislator, legislature and get them, get them to fund that. Well, I also want to say a few things about what I've been through in the last couple of years with my battle over the income tax. And, um, and in, 19, or in 2010, I was the uh, fifth biggest news item in Idaho, which is not something I really particularly want to repeat. <laughs> and, um, and I don't even want to go into the gory details of what kept me in the news so much, but, but let me just really quickly recap uh, where I've been in it. It's about a 15 year battle I've been fighting, and some of the things that I think relate to the legislature, and some of the things that are going to be a little unpleasant for me to say, but nonetheless, things I think you need to understand so you know what the playing field looks like, and we know how to, to run, advance the ball of liberty forward. So just real quickly, I sued the IRS because I thought the income tax was unconstitutional. My case took seven years. When I went to tax court, it took 17 months for the judge to, to rule on my uh, brief, which is highly unusual. And I went out there in that 17 months because I went to see my file. And I couldn't find my file, which is also highly unusual. The tax court is in Washington, D.C., so I was in Washington, D.C. wanting to see my file, and they, they couldn't find it. And when I petitioned the, the uh, United States Supreme Court, the clerk of the court's office actually called me about five times and uh, wanted me to submit more documents and, and wanted to talk to me about my argument. And, and uh, you know, all, all the people I know who have been down that road, I, I don't know anybody who got five phone calls from the, from the clerk's office. But nonetheless, they didn't take my case. And so that was the end of my judicial process. And that took seven years. Well, in the meantime, Realizing that I was in for really quite the fight, I just started researching everything I could research about the income tax, and reading all the literature I could read, and realizing that there's a big gaping hole in the literature out there, and no one really addressed the intent of the, of the income tax. So I went back east, I probably, I don't know how many times went to the Library of Congress, somewhere around 12 to 14 times, and I literally read everything there was to read in the Library of Congress 
on the on the origins of the income tax. And typically, what I do is I just photocopy it all, and I go home with like three thousand pages of photocopies. I felt like I was in Las Vegas, just feeding the photocopy machine all kinds of coins, and then I read it when I got home. But um, uh, so once I kind of got through all that material, I realized you know I need to write a book about this because I've discovered a lot of information that isn't in any of the li literature, and I think people need to know uh, what I've discovered. And so I went ahead and I, I wrote a book called Constitutional Income. It's 450 pages and it's got about 7, 000, uh, 700 quotes in it. And uh, so that kind of made me a target. And, and once I lost my case to the IRS, I, I didn't file returns during those years, so I filed all my returns. That actually took me a couple years to get caught up on that. But when I was all caught up, I got audited, no surprise there. But what was a surprise is the IRS wanted me to turn over the names and addresses, phone numbers and credit card numbers of everybody who bought my book as part of this audit. So I refused to do that, and I was very fortunate because I was defended by the uh, Center for Individual Rights, a First Amendment freedom of speech law firm in Washington, D.C. They defended me uh, pro bono, and we won that lawsuit. It took uh, two years, or actually four lawsuits. But anyways, when that was over, then we got on with the audit, and the audit took a little over more, uh, about another year and a half. And when that was over, uh, the IRS, I guess to get even with me for not turning over the names of people bought my book, they denied all my business deductions for eight years, which obviously raised my taxable income up to the outer space. And then I ended up with, with liens on me. And I, I kind of made a couple of mistakes on how to handle that. And through lots of uh, effort, but fruitless effort, I never got my day in court to challenge that decision of denying all those deductions. And so what you re read in the newspaper about me was I owe these mega uh, thousands of dollars in taxes based on this elevated amount of income, but you never read about the elevated amount of income or where that came from or the fact that I, I refused to turn over the names and addresses of the people who bought my book, which is defending their First Amendment right to free speech to be able to read a book without the government looking over their shoulder. And you would yeah. think that... You would think the media would appreciate that since they're the champions of the First Amendment. Well, uh, that was not the case, and I've learned a lot about the media uh, through, that, through that process. But what was kind of surprising to me, uh, in, in all that controversy, and being on the front page many, many times, and, and, and being this big news item, and having ethics complaints filed against me, and, and the, the ethics committee working their way through that, uh, there was never any scrutiny over the book that I wrote. And um, the media never looked at the book. I gave them copies of it. Uh, there was never a tax professional, no law uh, professor, not anybody looking over the work that I did that was sort of the root of all this controversy. It was just the surface stuff, kind of this name calling process and just kind of repeating uh, buzzwords and buzz phrases like the media is some kind of chatty Cathy that you pull the string and they just say something and really no critical analysis. And um, uh, it, it really disappointed me. I mean, the name of my book was, is Constitutional Income. It's just two words. And that word Constitution's in there. And you know, when we serve in public office, we take an oath to defend the Constitution, both the national constitution and the state. And what, what is very surprising to me is not one of my colleagues in the legislature ever asked me a critical question, a technical question about my work on the income tax. And you know, like, you know, Phil, you've obviously passionate about this, you know, tell us where you're coming from. Or I read your book, about half a dozen of them did, I read your book and explain this to me or explain that to me. Or, or where did you get this evidence? Or how, are, how can you be so sure of your conclusions? And you would think with all the attention that got and, and kind of all the pressure that was out there that, that there would have been uh, folks that wanted to get to the bottom of it, wanted to understand it. Particularly with that word being in the, in the title of the book, Constitution, and the oath that we take to defend the Constitution of both the United States and the state of Idaho. And, um, 
So I thought, well, maybe it's because you know we're all so busy and, and we don't have time to read books. So I've, I've taken uh, my book and I, I put it into a DVD. So this is the Gerber Baby Food version of my book. So there should be no excuse for the people who ought to know what's in there to, to take a look at this and understand it. And you know, the government said I was uh, frivolous. And uh, I want to read a quote from, uh, this guy's endorsed my book, but I got his quote on my DVD. Um, this is from a guy named Paul Chappell. He was uh, an advisor in the United States Tax Court from 1955-1965. He worked in the office of uh, Chief Counsel in Washington, D.C. as the head of the legal office for the IRS from 1965-1973 and then uh, private practice since then. And he actually passed away in 2009. But he said, uh, reading Phil's work is like, uh, or reading Phil's work is like returning to law school. I'm sorry, I can't read it, it's too dark. So you just have to get a copy and go for yourself. <laughs> okay, thanks. Reading Phil works like returning to law school. After decades of practice as a tax attorney, Phil makes me feel as if I'm a student again. So let me just let me just uh, describe uh, about uh, the first little piece of this of this DVD. What I did is I took the whole issue.